Welcome back to another segment of Through Different Eyes, a program that is dedicated to communicate God's way of seeing life situations and His way of healing the broken heart. You may have heard the story, but it's a thought provoker. Two traveling angels stopped to spend the night in the home of a wealthy family. The family was rude and refused to let the angels stay in the mansion's guest room. Instead, the angels were given a small space in a cold basement. As they made their bed on the hard floor, the older angel saw a hole in the wall, and he repaired it. When the young angel asked the older angel why he plugged that hole in the wall, the older angel replied, the things aren't always what they seem. The next night, the pair came to rest at the house of a very poor but very hospitable farmer and his wife. After sharing what little food they had, the couple let the angels sleep in their bed where they could have a good night's rest. When the sun came up the next morning, the angels found the farmer and his wife in tears. Their only cow, whose milk had been their sole income, lay dead in the field. The younger angel, infuriated, asked the older angel, how could you have let this happen? The first man had everything, the young angel said, and yet you helped him, he accused. The second family had little, but was willing to share everything, and you let the cow die. The older angel replied, things aren't always what they seem. When we stayed in the basement of the mansion, the elder angel replied, I noticed that there was gold stored in the hole in the wall. Since the owner was so obsessed with greed and unwilling to share his good fortune, I sealed the wall so he wouldn't find it. Then last night, as we slept in the farmer's bed, the angel of death came for his wife. I gave him the cow instead. Things aren't always what they seem. As his story implies, how often, often things don't turn out the way that we think they should, and we wonder, well, how come? Why didn't it work out the way I wanted it to? And of course, the answer is, things aren't always what they seem. A major portion of our reactions to the happenings of life that we face are based upon our perceptions, the way we view things, the way we think about things. Is the situation really what it seems to be? The truth of the matter, most of the time, we don't know. And may I suggest that we will never know until, until, dear friends, we are willing to think about it. We are willing to see it as God sees it. One of the insights, one of the insights that God is bringing home to my understanding as my wife Patsy and I have interacted over the years with just a, a unique variety of wellness guests who've gone through the wellness program there at the Black Hills Health and Education Center, is this fact. Even though a person may not understand why something's happening, or even be able to change the events occurring around him, that person does have the control over how he chooses to view, how he chooses to think about those events, and how he chooses to respond to them. For example, 
one person views a traffic jam as the end of the world, the worst thing that could have ever happened to them. And yet another person looks at that traffic jam as the opportunity to actually take a break from the rush of life. It's becoming very clear to me. Anyone who is willing to reconsider their personal viewpoint of a threatening situation to allow themselves to consider their particular situation through the eyes of God with a heartfelt willingness to bring their understanding of these difficulties into harmony with His all-knowing wisdom. They are actually enabled to see the trials in a hope-filled light and empowered to be freed from the debilitating emotions produced from their misunderstanding of God's providence. I'm so thankful for that. And even though they may not be completely freed from the pain of their physical condition, or even have all the answers to the questions they have about their life situation, their difficulties, their pain, it's a beautiful thing to know that when they begin looking at the situation through God's eyes, they can find peace. There's nothing so debilitating mentally, spiritually, physically than those feelings of bitterness, frustration, anger, anxiety, and fear over something that has happened in our lives that didn't turn out the way we thought it should. But when there's a willingness to examine life's events and situations through a loving Heavenly Father's eyes and respond accordingly, it brings with it freedom from the painful feelings that control so many lives, including so many Christians in the 21st century. Along with this godly viewpoint, not only is there a freedom from damaging emotions, but also there comes a growing freedom from the unhealthy physical responses that are the fruit of these injurious feelings. Friend, no matter what you are experiencing, it is possible to be freed from the negative emotions that may be controlling your life right now. It is possible to grow into a life of continual peace that Jesus offers us and desires for all of us to experience. He tells us in John 14, 27, and if you have your Bible handy, turn there with me and notice what Jesus gave to his disciples shortly before he was crucified. These beautiful words found in John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Question. A big question. What has God given us as the gold standard of truth to examine our perceptions and responses to life's events and situations, particularly those that threaten our sense of well-being. Well, I'm sure you guessed it. Through the means, here they are. This is the means by which God communicates His peace, His comfort, His hope, the healing that transcends human understanding. In Romans 15, verse 5, the Lord gives us these awesome words. Turn there with me, if you would. Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. And notice what God offers us through His Word that people are spending megabucks going to other human beings, to counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, to find. 
Romans 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written before, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. I like that, don't you, friends? No charge, free of charge. Actually, God's original design. And it comes to us, this peace and patience and comfort and hope and learning. It comes to us free of charge from God's Word through His Spirit. Psalms 107, verse 20, tells us this. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. What did He send? He sent His Holy Word. I like that. Let me give you five hope-filled Bible texts that have actually freed me personally from the challenges, the, the struggles that God has allowed me to experience. Five hope-filled promises that have actually given me the freedom to be able to communicate these facts to you because I'm experiencing them, dear friends, and you can too. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. If you turn there with me right now, that would be wonderful. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. You must have a look at these and just see the awesome beauty there is in God's promises. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The Lord communicates this to Jeremiah as he is just about to bring his people out of bondage. And this is what he tells Jeremiah. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. By the way, do you know what the expected end that God offers each one of us in the 21st century? It's actually the original beginning. God originally created us in His image, in perfect peace, with a clear mind, in harmony with His thoughts. Sin damaged that image, and now through His Word, through the work of the Holy Spirit with our cooperation, He is offering to you, dear friend, as He's offering to me, restoration back to the original design. You can read about it in Romans chapter 8, 28 and 29. Watch it close. Well, back to the promise that God's thoughts towards us are thoughts of peace and not of evil. Back to that awesome promise. Whatever situation that you are facing in your life right now, no matter how discouraging it is, no matter how challenging it is, dear friend, understand and know that God's thoughts towards you are still thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Quite often, in these situations that kind of threaten our sense of well-being, quite often we catch ourselves, at least I have, catch ourselves responding to God's efforts to help us, just like the woman who was driving home from work one evening and noticed in her rearview mirror a truck, and the truck was right up on her tail. The trucker was staying right there behind her. The woman pressed on her accelerator to give a little distance between her and the trucker. And she glanced in her rearview mirror again, and wouldn't you know it, he was still right on her tail. She spotted an off-ramp where there was a gas station, and she pulled onto that on off-ramp to head for help. The trucker stayed right on her tail. Pulling into the gas station pumps, she jumped out of her car and ran into the station and cried for the attendant to call 911, which the attendant did. Looking back at her car, guess what she saw? There, the trucker's truck right behind her vehicle. 
the trucker jumping out of the cab, running over to her car, and jerking open the back door of her car, reaching in and pulling out a man out of her back seat, a man who had been lying down on the floorboards just waiting for something. In a few short moments, the police pulled into the gas station and assisted that trucker to subdue and handcuff a man who turned out to be a convicted rapist. What appeared to that woman as a mad truck driver trying to do her harm was actually a very sincere unknown friend who, from his high vantage point of the truck cab over and above, had seen the danger she was in and determined to save her from an incredible danger. Is there a lesson for us here? I think there is. I wonder how often we, because of the way we're thinking about a situation that threatens our sense of well-being, we fall into the same experience of running away from God's help rather than thanking and praising Him for the way of deliverance and healing He offers. How often I found myself like the young angel in the opening story immediately reacting to situations, judging things good or bad, without giving God the opportunity to reveal to me His viewpoint concerning what's happening. Has that ever happened to you? Well, our second promise is found in John chapter 19, verse 11. Here is the account of Jesus standing before Pilate quietly just before Pilate sends him off, commits him to be crucified. And Pilate, of course, because Jesus is no longer responding to Pilate's questions, is a bit angry, a little hot under the collar if he had one. And Pilate says in verse 10, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify you and have power to release you? And I love Jesus' answer because it's the second promise for us. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given to thee from above. Oh, friends, I like that, don't you? To just know there is no power in earth or heaven, no situation, no problem, nothing that threatens our sense of well-being that can actually, actually do the harm that God is keeping us from. What a wonderful piece it is to accept the fact that the enemy truly has no power at all against us except that which God allows for our personal growth. I want you to turn now to Luke chapter 10 for another promise, the promise Jesus gave His disciples when they we're going out to minister in His name. <clears throat> Verse 19 says this, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. I am so grateful for that incredible promise. For someone who is desiring to follow Jesus, just like the weightlifting equipment in an exercise gym that actually gives physical muscles some resistance so those muscles have something to work against so they can get stronger instead of weaker. So it is with trials. Friends, trials are nothing more than the spiritual weightlifting equipment that God calls us to exercise our faith muscles on not to hurt us, but to strengthen us. I want you to see James chapter 1. Here is the reason why James chapter 1 talks about counting it all joy in our trials. James chapter 1. I love this, and if you've got your Bible, I hope that you'll turn there with me, or at least sometime. Here it is, James 1, 
verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Count it all what? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm growing this awareness, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, things that threaten our sense of well-being. He goes on, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I love that, don't you? This is so amazing that God is actually growing us in our challenges, growing us to the point where we can actually count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Just like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice what the Apostle Paul here says. He tells some of his experience. And I think it is so awesome. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul has begged God to remove the thorn of flesh, the the thorn in his flesh that's just threatening his sense of well-being and giving him all kinds of bad feelings. And the Lord communicates to Paul, I'm reading now in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, listen to that, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then the Apostle Paul communicates the same thing that James just told us. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in weaknesses, in persecution, in reproaches, in necessities, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. (sighs) Now, what does God promise us when he does allow something that threatens our sense of well-being to actually confront us? We find the promise, and this is the third promise. I'm going to get through them all. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is what God promises to us when we are confronted, when He allows something that threatens our sense of well-being. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Notice what it says. Therefore, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Wow. This text is a key. This is a key to answering a dilemma that many Christians have struggled with when facing difficult trials in their life. Turn with me and notice the Bible text that has thrown so many people off. It's found in Psalms chapter 34. Beautiful Psalms 34 with great encouragement, but a bit of a challenging text until we consider it in the light of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Here's what Psalms 34, 19 says. It says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Did you catch that? Delivers him out of how many? Out of them all. How many? Delivered out of all of them. Is the Lord lying? We've all seen someone who has been faithful, who's been a very fruitful Christian, has had nothing but honesty and kindness and generosity in their life, who has gone all the way to their deathbed, sick and dying, in pain, and yet they were never delivered or so many people think. But did really, really did God deliver them? He did, dear friends, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I believe God delivered them very distinctly and powerfully. In what way, you say? Deliverance, not from physical pain and death, but from the temptation to turn from God because of their trouble and because of their pain, to turn from God and disobey Him, delivered, kept faithful to the Lord through the trial. 
God provided for them the necessary power of his grace to bear the trial and remain faithful to him through the difficult situations, just like he has done through, for all of his faithful men and women throughout the Bible, throughout history. Daniel and his friends, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the disciples, Jesus, which leads us to promise number four, a challenging yet incredibly hope-filled promise found in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, would you? And just let your eyes soak in the amazing statement here. Bit of a challenge, but incredibly hope-filled. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Now, can you think of a godly reason why a follower of Jesus Christ can give thanks in everything? Well, here's an important one. Promise number 5, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. Notice what it says there. By the way, I hope you're writing these texts down so you can go back and focus in on the power of the truth behind them. Romans chapter 8, verses 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, Jesus, his Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Wow! Did you catch that? For we know that all things, how many things? All things work together for good for those who love God. I am so grateful that God, through Romans 8, 28, and 29, has brought us right back to what he promised in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. What's the good thing found in Romans 8, 29? What's the good purpose for which God promises everything will work towards good for? Did you catch it there? to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be like Jesus. Friends, God's thoughts towards you, his thoughts towards me, are not of evil. His thoughts towards me are thoughts of peace, thoughts of peace to give us an expected end, the original beginning, to be restored back into the image of Jesus. And, of course, with that, along with that, comes peace and joy and love and rest and quietness and confidence. All the fruits of having a mind that has stayed upon God. Thank you for tuning in, dear friends. And until next time, remember this. Fear thou not, for I am with you. God's promise. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. God's promise to you. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God bless you. Courage.